I really woke up today and was like, hey, let's let's start off with a light topic. You know, let's do something casual. Let's uh, let's discuss something pretty low key, like uh, how I grew up most of my life, pretty much my entire life without a dad after he passed away in a car accident at six years old. Let's just dive into that. <laughs> and um, I hope you know when I'm laughing too, it's not like trying to belittle anything or make light of anything. It's, it's an easy way to process the grief and process things that have happened to you. But I do wanna talk about it because jokes aside, laughs aside, there's a lot of grit here. There's a lot of material here. And I think that while Maybe not a lot of people have their father pass away at six years old, like I did. I think it's really common for people to grow up without a father figure, whether that means a dad that was technically there and may have met their like basic needs, but never showed up for them as a father figure, or people who grew up with divorced parents and didn't spend much time with their dad, or people that grew up and you know their dad left them at a young age. I mean, there's, there's a million scenarios of people that can access and relate to the type of pain that I experienced for not having a dad. I think it's really important to talk about. My journey was unique. And I wanna add that like, I really have, a, this, this whole video could be like how I grew up without a family because while I wasn't completely separated from my family until I was like 17, 18, I've grown up with without any kind of familial support my whole life. But I wanna, I wanna focus at least on the dad component because of how significant that is, you know what I mean? When you're a kid and you grow up, your dad is like your hero. Right, and I think a lot of kids experience this where they'll, they'll grow up and like, you'll sort of favor one parent as a kid, and then as you get older, you sort of mature a bit, you balance out, you recognize that, you know, like in most cases, you both of your parents are great people and you love them equally, and that's kind of how you roll. I think one of the things that sucks about my situation was that my dad passed away when he was like my hero, you know? Like he was the person that I, I looked up to the most, like I idolized him in every way, like he had, he was the, he was the man with the cape, he had the superpowers. That's the relationship that I had with him. So losing him was brutal. And the story, I mean, I remember, I remember how I learned, I'll never forget the day. It was a Friday the 13th that he passed, which I've always found wild, like April 13th, 2003. And I found out we were taking a road trip from New York where I lived to Tennessee to see my grandparents. And I remember when we arrived, we were taken upstairs to the bonus room, like the attic area. And my grandparents sat me down and my mom broke the news. I'll never forget, I should say, like how much I cried, like just the, the most moans and like the just the agonizing screams and just reality coming full force delivering its truth without any sort of softness warning or relief it is what it is you can't change it and having to realize that i think at any age is hard having to realize it at six is a level of difficulty i don't think i've ever confronted in my entire life it was it probably was the hardest thing that I ever had to endure because of everything. I mean, it's it's a, how much even needs to be said on why it's hard to lose your dad at six years old, especially when you look up to him in the way I did. Not having a great relationship with my mom as a child led to a lot of disengagement from my entire family in general. My family's response to my dad passing away was particularly like not the best and was very like, let's just not talk about it or deal with it. Just from the jump, the work that I had to do to recover from this was extraordinary. I didn't have like the benefit of counseling or therapy. And to the contrary, I had a family that like actively repressed and chastised, like criticized doing those kinds of things. Like we were told that, you know, if we were good Christians, because my family grew up insanely religious, like toxically so, we were told that if we were, you know, just good Christians and we, you know, listened to God and we did the right thing, that like this would all work out. My mom never remarried. She was never interested in that. And we kind of knew that she wouldn't. And so I grew up pretty much my entire life from six years old on without a dad. I still remember him. Like I still, I, I remember exactly what he was like. He was like, I think he was like six, three. He was big. He's like 250 pounds. He had, um, he's balding a little bit. And he had like a very red face just from all the construct. He did like rural construction. So he, he was just, he was just like that. The thing that everyone remembers about him is just how incredibly generous he was. He was just like the guy that took care of everything for other people. And that's all he really wanted to do with his life was just to be kind, mow the neighbor's yard, shovel their snow, build stuff for them. You know, we never had much money at all, but he was just like, he was animated by his relationships and by the people he had in his life. And I, I, I think to this day, draw a lot of inspiration from that. But the question is like, how do you deal with that? You know, especially if you're not given the tools of therapy, if you're act, you know, actively discouraged from pursuing them, how do you possibly make sense of a life in which you're supposed to now live without a dad? I think from a very early age, I had this permanent thorn in my side where like, no matter how I 
tried to cope with the news. Every single day that went by, I was like, you know what? This sucks. I don't have a dad. I don't have a, I don't have someone to look up to. I don't have someone to talk to. And I think the first way that I coped early on as a child was like to constantly, not like live in denial, but to constantly fantasize that there was some way he could come back. And so intensely that like, you know, I knew that he was dead. Like we had his ashes, but I would still just like dream and like have these visions that like, no, maybe he escaped the car crash. Maybe those weren't his ashes. Maybe, maybe there is some way, right? And I guess as I'm saying this out loud, it kind of is denial. Not an insistent sense where I would, I would like tell other people that that's true, but where I felt it deeply. Yeah, I felt that like he had to, that there was no way that he could just be, you know, like, gone like that and just never to be seen again. As a kid who's barely, you know, you're six years old, there are a lot of concepts that come to you and you're like, you can barely really process them yet. Your brain is just fresh, you know, it hasn't had the time. So to process something like someone's death rapidly, immediately, and someone so precious to you, it just, in many senses of the term, it's not possible. You know, I think post denial, after I started to accept it a little bit more and, and understand it, I think the next stage of my processing was, I don't want to say like annoyance, but there was this like constant chip on my shoulder of like, everyone else gets a dad but me, this sucks. And it was very hard for me to not see and observe exactly how impactful that was. Like, you know, friends would like, let go, let's say go to baseball practice or soccer practice or whatever, and like they would have an additional parent, an additional parental unit that would pick them up or drop them off or show up to games or like film them, whatever it was. And it was just like this constant realization of like, I don't have that. I don't have that thing that everyone else has. And it was this, it was, I think it was this annoyance and frustration because I felt like so many other people took it for granted that they just, you get to have a dad, like he just gets to be there and I didn't. And and that feeling of like, this is not supposed to happen, like, where, like why is my deck of cards being cut so differently from other people, led me to resent the universe a lot and resent God and res re whatever filled that void of the cosmic causer of the force that does these things, whether we call that God of the universe, I wasn't really sure, fully sure what all of my beliefs were about that, but I like, knew that whatever was out there, I was pissed. Cause I'm like, how the hell could you do this to me? You know, like life's hard enough growing up super poor, life's hard enough growing, you know, growing up without a lot of friends in a, in a not a great area, but like now I don't get to have a dad either. Like how, how the hell is this possible? Like how, like how on earth could this possibly be my life? I don't think I ever conveyed my frustration, my chip on the shoulder to other people. Like I would never like get jealous of a friend or something, but I think I really looked for a father figure where I could. Like if I had a, I remember I had this one friend, his name was Dylan and uh, I know his, his like, he, he didn't have much of a dad either, but his, uh, his grandfather kind of took the lead on that. And so his grandfather, you know, he got, he got me into football. He got me to be a Peyton Manning fan at a young age. And like, like really wrote, like taught me everything there is to know about football, which is what got me into the sport. I remember he would take us on fishing trips. He would take us out, you know, he would host us. We'd do sleepovers at his place with all the boys. And just like, you know, I lived in Tennessee at the time too. So we would all get out and like play games, run around in the yard. Like we had that, we had that outdoor life. You know, we had, I should say we had that offline life. We, we had that not using our phone life. And there were a lot of people that stepped up to the plate to help. I, a lot of people in the community knew that I didn't have a dad. And so they would step up to the plate and, you know, play tennis with me or, you know, we do these fishing trips, whatever it was. Like I definitely felt the presence of people in my life sort of in these really small ways, like try to step up to the plate and just try to make sure that we were occupied. And by we, I mean me and my siblings, knowing that we were all in the same boat. And I think every time that happened, there was a sense in which I was grateful. Like I was like, cool, we're going fishing, I'm having a good time. But I always remember that at the end of the experiences, I would feel so hollow, you know? I would feel like, this person really is trying and stuff, but just nothing, it doesn't feel like I hoped it would feel, you know? And that's nothing on them, they're doing their best, but almost disempowering feeling that all of these attempts I'm making to compensate for not having a dad just aren't working. So going from denial to frustration to this like attempted compensation, trying to find some, some thing that can like fill that gap and that void in my life led to this further emptiness where I was just like, I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to redeem this experience. I'm not really sure exactly how I'm supposed to make sense of this and not constantly live with this sense of void. And I think this is the most important part of the journey. This feeling that Something profound has been taken away from you. Something amazing and deep has been ripped from you. And I think the most basic reaction to that is, am I just supposed to live the rest of my life knowing that I'm missing something? Like I lose an arm and I'm just supposed to live the rest of my life looking at my left and being like, there's no arm there. 
Is that it? Is that, is that, is that how we process this? Is the goal going to be in life to just minimize the importance of that? You know, to like, how can I make it as unimportant as possible that I don't have a dad? And like, that's, that's also a bit of a race to the bottom because you're constantly looking to minimize the significance of having parents. And I don't know about you, but that is a very significant thing innately, <laughs> like for any species to have parents. The mental math and the acrobatics that I would take to try to minimize that were strenuous to say the least. Like it was almost impossible to live through the experience by just shrugging it off. And I, I, I hit a real wall where I was like, I don't really know how I'm ever supposed to get past this. I feel like my only two options are to find some kind of replacement or to not care that there isn't a replacement and just sort of mentally minimize that. And I waffled back and forth between those two for so much time, not finding any hope or help within them. Like nothing felt positive or inspiring about that experience. So what I really encountered, and I think this is important, what I really encountered is a paradox. A paradox is a split of two seemingly impossible choices. Like you can't, you know, you're between a rock and a hard place essentially. And the thing that I always find interesting about the paradox, which let's be clear here, the paradox is I can just try to compensate for this by, I don't know, finding a replacement, finding something else to fill that void, or I can act like the void doesn't matter that much. So fill it or minimize it. Both of those options sucked. Like both of those options left me miserable and unhappy. So I'm like, I'm not really sure exactly how I'm supposed to change all this, right? And in thinking about all that, one of the things that I find so interesting about a paradox and the way that all paradox, paradise, paradox, I think it's paradoxes. I think so. Um, the way that any paradox is resolved is not by choosing one of the two impossible choices. It's always by creating a third option that combines elements of both. In other words, synthesis. The antidote of all paradox is a synthesis and you have to find out what that is. You'll never resolve a paradox by just choosing one of them. It doesn't work that way. And the synthesis that I found, I remember so distinctly, I was thinking one day about it my dad's death and the ripple effect that it had on my life, the, the chain and series of dissatisfying outcomes and scenarios I was left with as a result of that. And I was thinking, I was like, you know what? There has to be something positive about this. Like you remove everything. You remove a dad, you remove that father figure, you remove the support, the, fi the financial and familial support I would have had from that. But there has to be something about this that's positive. There's no way that it's all bad. And I, I can't really emphasize how important that conclusion is. This insistent belief, this, this almost like on faith belief that there has to be some aspect of the experience that is positive. I think we can find that that's true in a lot of circumstances. You know, you're getting a shot at the doctor and it's profoundly unpleasant. You know, you're, you're a kid screaming at the needle, but there is something positive about that. Not just whatever you're getting a shot of, whether you're getting your blood drawn or whatever else, but the fact that you are building character in that moment is still something that can be gleaned from it. You're almost like you're, <laughs> you're dumpster diving. You're, dump you're mentally dumpster di diving into like a recess of hell. Uh, like a terrible thing and a terrible thing, like a terrible moment you're experiencing and you're digging into it like, well, there has to be some fresh food in here. There has to be some nugget of gold that will have justified all of this. And I don't think that finding that is easy. I don't like, I don't bring that up to say that you can just walk around in life after, you know, receiving the worst abuse and tragedy of all time and just go like, well, it's gotta be good somewhere. You know, I think that that's short-sighted. But what I don't think is short-sighted is the acknowledgement there, that there is an aspect of the experience that isn't negative. And perhaps over time, the, the magnitude of whatever that quote unquote silver lining is, might be bigger than you realize. The thing that I realized about not having a dad was that it gave me a source of motivation more powerful than anything my peers, friends, classmates, et cetera, could tap into. You think about how much longer life is. I mean, you're, you know, even if you're 10 and you're immature, you can't deny that you probably have a few decades in front of you. And with those few decades, you're gonna be doing shit. I mean, you're gonna, hopefully, you're gonna try to achieve something with your life and succeed. You're gonna go to college and get good grades or you're gonna find a job and perform well in that. Like, hopefully someday you wanna build your own family and you wanna have a wife and, and kids. And you think about the myriad of milestones that are left for you, how there's so much left to explore, there's so much left to dive into. And when you think about all of that, you have to ask, what is gonna be my motivation for being exceptional? Because I don't, you know, I have no interest in living a mediocre life. I don't wanna just be average. And I don't really think there's any source of motivation greater than this would have been exactly what my dad would have wanted me to do. And given that he's gone and that I'll never see him again, I don't think there's anything more powerful than deciding to live my life in honor and tribute to him.
It's the best I've got. If he can't be here, and if I can't make him proud while he's in front of me, then let me at least make him proud while he's looking down from the sky. Like, let me, let me at least live a life that is so exceptional that someone in the afterlife could look back on it and be like, damn, that's big. I remember at my father's funeral, my grandfather, who was like 98 years old at the time, pulled me aside. I was holding, um, I was holding this picture of my dad. I was crying. I, I, I'd been sort of like laughing and cheerful and, and just like a range of different emotions at the funeral. Grief is a weird thing, especially in children. It's always very, it's very volatile. You don't really know how it's gonna go. But I remember sitting there in that chair, my grandfather, he pulled me aside and he was like, Joseph, the survivors are never average. Either the fire consumes them or they consume the fire. And the thing that he kept pleading with me to understand, I mean, this man's 98. He's not always all the way there, but he was sharp this time. He was, this is, it was a good day for him. Like he was on top of it. And the thing that he kept pleading with me to understand is that my life is very long for one. And that throughout that life, I'm never going to be average. Like for the rest of my life, rather than other people telling me, you know, you'll get, you'll get over this and you'll recover. He was like, no, 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 no. You're not going to recover. You're going to evolve. In fact, you are going to change radically as a result of this experience. You're never going to be the same way. You're never going to be the kid that you were playing with chalk, you know, running around carefree, like that kid's dead. He's gone. And something different is going to emerge from this. And of all of the people that spoke to me at my funeral, I think my grandpa said the most real shit to me that anyone ever has. Like I, I'd never, I'd, no one else at the funeral was capable of delivering that level of mentorship to me at such a young age. And I still, it's like one of those things that's so burned into my memory. Like I'll never forget the speech, short as it was. I'll never forget how he spoke to me and the things that I knew he wanted me to hold on to. The idea is that after I get through this experience, you know, losing my dad. There's no way that it can't change me forever. And if it is gonna change me forever, it's gonna change me in one of two directions. It's either gonna change me, send me spiraling, like I'll be one of those kids that just, you know, loses their dad, you know, gets involved in the wrong friend group, gets addicted to drugs, whatever, lands, you know, lands himself in jail, whatever that is. I'll be that or I will spiral up and I will become something exceptional. I will wake up every day with a drive to be the best person I can be and to honor the legacy of my dad by building an incredible life that I share with other people. Building incredible relationships and experiencing profound intimacy because that's exactly what he would have wanted, you know? And that's a way to, it's, it's also what I want, right? But it's, it's a way to bring honor to something that was lost. And I think the idea of like honoring your ancestors, we can kind of think about that in a stereotypical way or like a ritualistic way, but we need to understand the important human tradition of that. Like, like that's not, that's not just like one religions or one culture's thing. That's, that's universal. We all want to bring honor and respect and dignity to the people that have gone on before us. When I started to tap into this idea that like, wow, I could actually, I could actually make something of this. I started thinking and feeling very differently. It didn't really hit me fully until I was, I think like 11, 11 or 12, but I started to do things specifically because I knew that they would make my dad proud and I knew that that was the kind of man that I wanted to become. I had this like locked focus on growing up and becoming a man someday and having to answer and be like, well, how did you, how did you use this incredible thorn? How did you use this incredible dagger that was twisted into you? And the story that I always wanted to be able to tell was I got up and I worked twice as hard as everyone else because I could feel the presence of my dad behind me as I studied or as I wrote papers or as I hit the gym or as I did sports or learned to play piano, whatever it was, I knew that the impact of someone that had gone before me would be permanent. And the cool thing is that it was, it lasted forever. Even to this day as a 27 year old man, not a day has gone by that the thought of my dad does not push me forward and make me want to live a better life, both for me and for other people. It motivates me to want to become a dad someday and to give my future kids a childhood that they won't have to recover from and a dad that will get to see them at their 10th birthday party, you know? It motivates me to want to really build close friendships with anyone that I can and experience that incredible bond of brothership, not just because I don't have a family, but because I feel like that's, that's what my dad did. Like that's exactly what he did with his life. And his, in the only, you know, in the six years that I knew him and probably only three or four of them are useful for building memories. Like we don't really remember stuff before we're two. That's all I knew about him. And that's all that people said about him after he was gone. And I hope that's what people say about me, you know? And that's why like, when I think about his memory and everything, that's like been such a powerful realization for me is carry on that reputation. Like think about your bloodline. Think about everyone else before you that went before, you know? What can you do? What kind of life 
Would they be proud to see you living? And how can you get closer to that? I didn't start going to therapy, therapy therapy until this year. And I'm not really, you know, like a lot of what I'm covering in therapy right now has nothing to do with my dad per se. Like I, you know, it's not something that I feel like has needed like a whole bunch of therapy. And I think that surprises people to hear. Like, well, how could you not go to therapy for that? It's like the most traumatic thing ever. And I think it's because one of the best forms of closure we can give ourselves, and just to stop real quick, but closure being like the goal, you know, like you wanna find peace in your situation. You wanna find peace with what's happened to you. I think one of the most profound and amazing senses of closure we can give ourselves, especially with great loss, is this feeling that we have used it to create something more meaningful. It's like a shattered vase that we pick up and turn into a mosaic, a mosaic more valuable than the vase ever was. And I think that that motif, I hope that motif speaks to you. Because I think that it is really the solution for things like this. Exactly how, exactly what that narrative is and how you overcome your tragedy is not something that I can really tell you per se. Like it's not scriptable. And outside of, you know, a deep conversation with one other person that, that knows this, it can be very hard to unpack exactly what your options are. But I can tell you what your options aren't. Your options aren't to mitigate it in your mind and act like it doesn't matter. Your options are not to just baselessly, you know, fill the void and try to find replacements. Like, it's not that, I know that much. And it's not to feel angry, upset, frustrated, and pissed off that the universe has let you down. No, it's not any of those things. It's redemption. It's the feeling that you've taken an experience that was relentlessly shitty and have made it into something incredible. I think that is the ultimate triumph and it is the ultimate form of closure you can give yourself in situations like this. The motivation of not having a dad, the motivation of wanting to live to make him proud, the motivation of wanting to make everyone question how you can be that loving when you've lost so much, that motivation to defy your statistics. It's gotta be one of the strongest things out there. In my life, after I lost my dad, I went on to do a bunch of insane shit. I like borderline taught myself how to play piano, composed three different albums by the time I was 13. I played soccer decently. I did sports, I did soccer and tennis for a number of years. I then did academic speech and debate, did really well in speech and debate, won nationals in my second year, won nationals again in my third year. That was a year while I was homeless, by the way, still won, and then started a company teaching academic speech and debate to high school students, giving kids the confidence they need to communicate openly and freely, as well as the confidence to think freely and form their own beliefs, rather than the ones they've inherited from family. And then after that, after that company succeeded and we trained like 30 national champions in four years, I got enough money to go to school and I was doing speech and debate coaching while I was in school. It wasn't like sequentially after that I did school, but I did school uh, at the same time uh, in Dallas. I got perfect grades in a couple of my majors, graduated with a philosophy, a business manager degree, a cognitive science minor, and then applied to law school and got a full ride at USC and then just graduated in May. And throughout all of these milestones, it's been hard at many times, especially like graduating from law school, like graduation sucked because I had to remember how I didn't have a family, you know? But the thing that I remembered was at every step, at every junction, at every milestone, at every achievement, I was able to look back and go, I am living the life that would make the most loved and important person in my life happy. And that's Jeff, Jeffrey Abel, my dad. I don't think that the vision for overcoming your trauma, your loss, your inexplicable pain has to be some profound mathematical problem. Sometimes I think it's really just as simple as deciding that what would be really important to you is to live a life that honors someone you deeply care about. And that's what I found. The funny thing is, we don't really know what happens when we die. And sometimes I wonder if I'm gonna bump into my dad again, whether that's his spirit or his consciousness or in heaven, whatever it is. I sometimes wonder if I'm gonna bump into him when I go to the same place that he is. And when I do, I know that like, he's probably gonna have some questions and he's gonna wonder if he hasn't, you know, been watching the tapes, he's gonna have to ask. And I think that one of the ways I have lived my life very deliberately is I've lived my life in preparation for that interview. That if I need to sit down and explain, I'll be like, this is exactly what I did. And I think the beauty of that is, this is more than compensation. This is more than filling the void that was left by someone, it's leverage. The thing I always felt as a kid was like, nobody here is as motivated as me because no one's lost what I did. No one's gonna work as hard for this paper, for this speech and debate championship title, for this law school exam. No one's gonna grind for it like I will because they don't have the same kind of fuel. They don't have the same kind of flame. That feeling that I could as a result be 
way more motivated than the average person became this self-fulfilling prophecy where I had to be great. I had to be great because I knew it was the right thing to do. I knew it brought honor to my dad. And more than anything, it just felt like it was the path. I promise you that no matter what you've lost, it can and it does get better. And when you're ready to take that first step to carve your own meaning, to write your own path out of what terrible, miserable experience you've had, you can take your entire life to a different level. Thanks for listening.